My goal was to stop my thoughts, and what I did was I watched them, and as I watched them, they slowed down, and then they completely stopped. So instead of there being thoughts moving through my mind, there was just this stillness and peace. And I felt so peaceful, and like all this torment that I'd been suffering through just wasn't there. I'd gone through all of this time in education, you know, I'd studied uh, medicine and psychology. I'd done all of this stuff that was in academia and education, but I had never been educated about this. I'd never been educated about something that existed inside of me that would bring me happiness. Hello, Jack. A warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to see where our conversation is going today. I always am. And I know you've had some mystical experiences. You've had sort of a an NDE or a light NDE experience. And then you went from being an atheist writing these uh, articles uh, on psychology to becoming the spiritual teacher, channeling deities and even dragons. And I don't have that many guests who are channeling dragons, and I would love to learn what that is, how that is possible. Uh, dragons, to me, you know, is something I, uh, well, it's a parallel to like fairy tales. When I think about dragons, I think about fairy tales, but uh, yeah. there's so much that is existing in this universe. So I'm really curious to learn more about that. Um, but I would love for you to share a little bit about your. Uh, your religious background or spiritual beliefs before you started having, before you actually uh, become became spiritual after being an atheist. Like, tell us more about that. Sure. First of all, it's it's funny to me to hear you repeat all that to me because it's like, yeah, like a lot has changed. Um, so I was raised technically in a Christian household uh, in the UK in the south of England. Um, though, like I was kind of made to go to church when I was very young, uh, but as soon as I was given a choice, I chose not to, um, because I personally saw, I didn't really like the feel of, of things at church. Like I felt like people were, were lecturing me and it just didn't, it never resonated with me. So my, what I saw spirituality as growing up was just religion and almost entirely uh, Christianity and the very specific form of Christianity that I was exposed to growing up. Um, so I didn't have interest in spirituality. In fact, I was very opposed to it. Um, and my interest went into science and philosophy and that was how I saw the world. So I am a separate object my consciousness is just a kind of quirk of my biology that's given some kind of evolutionary advantage um and it just happens to be here and when my body dies my consciousness will die and that's it game over that's what and you that's thought what you, that's what i thought mm. and it was terrifying right right i, I know I, I don't understand why atheists want to believe that <laughs> because it is really <laughs> terrifying. But I had to have my own proofs, and uh, that's part of why I'm doing this show. Is, is I'm I'm just so convinced now, and also because I've had my own spiritual experiences, which I know also you had. And we're going to do a channeling later on, and um, because the the dragons or the deities that you channel, they speak about the great return, and I'm very excited to learn more about that. And I know also that you've had um, struggle in your life. And I also find that important to mention so that, you know, everybody who's watching understand that it's not like you're all of a sudden start to channel and get all these answers and everything is just shiny and bright. But you actually came from a deep depression, like I've had yeah. myself. So is this depression or this story around that, is that linked to what happened when you one day went to YouTube and saw something that changed your life? Because I know you have a story about that. Yeah, so I didn't quite realize it at the time, but I, looking back at it, I can see that I had a traumatic childhood, um, that my both of my parents were abusive, um, often physically, 
mm. um, and emotionally neglectful. So my emotional needs were were never really met and and held. Uh, so life for me growing up was very frightening because I didn't have a safe place to go to. And I'm sure a lot of you will relate to that. Uh, I think it's quite common um, in sensitive people. And if you don't re relate to that, then you're, you're lucky. Um, so then when I went into my teenage years, I just did what most teenagers I knew did to try and cope with that, all that trauma that we carry. And that's to turn to uh, drink and drugs as a way of coping. Um, hoping that maybe through relationships, like through romantic relationships, I would find someone that would fill this hole that I kind of knew was there on some level. Um, but it never worked. And I was really in a downward spiral, especially when I got into my uh, early to mid 20s. Um, so I was increasing the drug use, using it as a way of trying to cope with everything, feeling just totally overwhelmed by everything that was happening in my life. And yeah, definitely feeling depressed. I think I was experiencing depression from childhood onwards, um, just kind of bouts of it, including uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, and it had got really bad um, around my mid twenties, you know, I was like actually making plans uh, for how I would take my life. Um, I knew where I was going to do, like where I was going to go, what I was going to do. And I was really in a lot of emotional torment. Um, and it was arising from my childhood. And I would say now actually also from uh, intergenerational trauma and cultural trauma that was in my system. But I, I had very little consciousness of that. I just knew I was in a huge amount of emotional pain. Um, there was a glimmer of light um, because I had just been accepted into a, a new job, uh, moving to a new city. At the time, I was living in Cardiff, and then I was getting ready to move to London. And it was filling me with a sense of possibility. It's like there was this glimmer of light, like, okay, maybe things are going to get better. So... I was feeling curious and open. And it was at that time that my housemate to be in London uh, messaged me and said, have you ever heard of Eckhart Tolle? Uh, I think you'd really like him. He's a spiritual teacher. And like, I didn't even really have a concept of what a spiritual teacher was. Like I literally had to Wikipedia um, spiritual teacher, I think, like literally. <laughs> 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 and um but i was very curious and open where normally i wouldn't be um so i i went on youtube and i looked at one of his videos um i don't remember which video it was like people ask me this all the time i think they're kind of hoping that they can track it down and have this same experience that i'm just about to describe but i looked at him and i wasn't even really listening to his words i was just looking at him and it was like everything else just faded into the background. And all I could see was him, like he was floating in space. And his image just like glowing with this golden white light. And my mind went quiet as I was watching him, almost as if my mind was being absorbed into his image. Um, I obviously had never experienced something like that before you know i'd experimented with some psychedelics but never very in a very extreme way and i was sober at this time um to make that clear so having a, an experience like that while completely sober was surprising to say the least um that alone would have really shaken my worldview um because I was experiencing something that my scientific background couldn't make sense of. However, because I was feeling curious, like, and I saw that one of his videos was called How to Stop Thinking. Um, so I decided that I would sit on my bed and I would try to meditate, which for me didn't have any kind of training involved in it. You know, I didn't know anything about meditation. It was literally just, I'll try and do this. And I just based it off what I'd seen in movies. 
Um, but to my surprise, it actually worked. So my goal was to stop my thoughts. And what I did was I watched them. So I was just witnessing thoughts arising in my mind. And as I watched them, they slowed down and then they completely stopped. Um, so instead of there being thoughts moving through my mind, there was just this stillness and peace, which was just like a blanket, just like holding me. And I felt so peaceful and relaxed. And like all this torment that I'd been suffering through just wasn't there. Um, and I just felt absolutely wonderful, like better than the experiences that I'd been having with drugs. Um, and obviously this was clean and healthy and free. And it was a very, it was a very special moment for me, probably the most important moment of my life. Um, because it revealed to me that there was something more that I'd gone through all of this time in education, you know, I'd studied uh, medicine and psychology, I'd done well at school, and I'd got a first class honors degree in applied psychology. I'd done all of this stuff that was in academia and education, but I had never been educated about this. I'd never been educated about something that existed inside of me that would bring me happiness. No one had ever told me about that in, in those 26 years. Uh, but I stumbled across that car and he obviously knew about it. Um, looking back at it now, you know, I can say, okay, I had a glimpse of my true nature. That's what happened in that moment. I was, I was witnessing my own presence, the stillness of my own presence and feeling the peace of my own being. Um, something else that happened during that experience was that I was looking around my room and it was like, almost like everything was transparent, like it almost like it was a hologram. And that that same light that I had seen shining in Eckhart was now shining in everything that I was looking at. And, um, that it was peaceful. Now, looking back at that, I can be like, oh, that is the light of my own being. I hadn't realized that at the time. I just knew that something very, very um, significant had happened. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I, I, I get these pictures in my mind and it, it's just so beautiful. And uh, I'm thinking, I, I find it interesting that some people uh, like you are experiencing this while others are not. And that. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are struggling and a lot of us want these experiences, but I'm not experiencing it. But that's why it's so healing to hear about experiences like these, I believe. And um, I also know that there was another experience that you also had. And that's also ex my experience that once you have a, a spiritual experience, more mystical experiences are starting to happen. It seems like you have opened up something. And I also have a theory that this is happening more, um, more spontaneously for more and more people, that this wasn't the case uh, many years ago. But now it's like popping up all over the place that more and more people are having these mystical experiences. Now, have you thought about or reflected about why you were so fortunate to have this mystical experience? Like, it seemed like you didn't ask for it. You just turned on a video of Eckhart Tolle and grace happened to you. Yeah. So, um, that's like, it's been a really interesting journey with that. Like, because I showed a really close friend of mine that same video and I expected him to have the same response. And I was shocked when he didn't. Um, and that kind of, it evoked kind of two things like, there's like an unhealthy side and a healthy side to what that evokes. So the unhealthy side is like, I am special and better than everyone else. You mm -hmm. know, the spiritual ego. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and looking back at my past with my childhood, like, and how I wasn't really loved very much. It's like that part of me was like, oh, okay, well, this can be the thing that makes me important and makes people love me. 
mm-hmm. you know, like that shadow side. And I think that's really important to to be aware of, you know, and I still have that. I still have this side, like I can still feel it. I can see see it as I'm speaking right now because it does not want to be spoken about. Like I can feel where it is in my body, you know, and I think that's it's really important to for anyone in my position or our position to be vocal about these things. Um, just to make sure that everybody out there knows that they're not alone when they start experiencing that and that that's okay. It's just part of the journey. Um, and we can all keep an eye on it. And, um, you know, it's when we start pushing it down and pretending like it isn't there and going into that whole kind of spiritual image of what a spiritual person is supposed to look like, like that we can really find ourselves in some hot water, um so i always want to be open about that the other side of it is is more kind of i think factual in a way where it's like okay i've lived quite a lot of past lives here um and some of them have started coming back um you know now and i you know i can remember bits and pieces um so it's like oh okay this happened to me because i have put in a lot of preparation in other lifetimes Mm. um, so that I was ready and it just took a small spark uh, to ignite me. Um, Yeah. And uh, moving over to this NDE experience that you had, was it really a near-death experience? And Because I understood it was linked to a lucid dream. Yeah, it's unusual. Um, some people, when I talk about it, they kind of question whether it is a real NDE or not, which is why I talk about it as an NDE-like experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but instead of it being triggered by like a car crash or a medical emergency, it was triggered by uh, a period of deep meditation. Um, so I was really focusing on my own nature, like the nature of myself as opposed to my ego um and doing that very consistently like and in a very disciplined way and um what that did was it it triggered some kind of a reaction inside of my psyche which flowered during a lucid dream where i was talking to uh, a mystic he looked like an indian mystic um and he was sat in front of me in this lucid dream. So, you know, I'm as conscious as I am now. And he was giving me a lesson. And he said to me, feel the awareness in your left hand, which I did. You know, I'm like, I can feel the sensations that are there in my left hand. And then feel the same in your right hand. So I feel that. And then he says to me, the hands are different. So I can feel my left hand in space. I can feel my right hand in space. They're in different places in space. And then he says to me, the awareness is one. And I realized that what was aware of my left hand and my right hand was the same thing. That there is only one awareness. Mm -hmm. And that recognition, it was like flipping a switch. And the whole dream collapsed in on itself. I was just in darkness and I felt my spine rotating backwards to this bizarre angle, like too far, like it shouldn't be able to go that far back. And it cracked in a really loud crack. Um, And then I, I went through what many NDE experiences talk about with this tunnel of light. Um, So I was just in darkness. I, it didn't really feel like I had a body um almost like i was just a point of consciousness and i saw this light in the distance and um the brighter it got the more that i felt and it a very intense sense of fear inside of my body but also uh ecstasy like incredible pleasure and both of those grew at the same time as the light was getting brighter and brighter Eventually it became, it was right in front of my face and um, not that I had a face, but you know what I mean. (laughs) And um, it was right in front of me and I felt this like uh, 
barrier between myself and the light and also that there was some kind of a presence outside of me that was giving me an invitation to cross over that barrier into the light and you know the fear was more it was so intense now you know it was like i literally felt like i was dying like on some kind of existential level like it's hard to describe if you've not experienced something like this but it's like we go through our lives on a kind of foundation there's a foundation that's there like our fundamental sense of identity that's there and what it felt like was that that was starting to disappear um which was terrifying but you know this isn't a horror story um <laughs> the the good thing is that this presence around me was really benevolent and was like like a loving parent just gave me this little nudge over the barrier um and i crossed over into the light and when i did that all the fear completely disappeared um like it had never been there and all i was feeling was this ecstasy um and all i could see was golden white light just this ocean of golden white light all around me um it was it was very intense um just unlike anything i'd ever experienced after a while i um wondered if my body was okay and then my consciousness came back into my body and my body was in this very strange posture in my bed with the same ecstasy moving up and down my spine really rapidly um after a while it died down uh, and then i i fell asleep um but that experience like so at the time i didn't know anything about kundalini um later i found out about kundalini and i read up on some articles and i was like oh wow okay like that sounds a lot like what happened to me so i think i basically i awakened my kundalini through that meditation experience and that that had catapulted me into a near death like experience um but that experience really what i find interesting about it is really what came afterwards um because it transformed my consciousness um yeah, opened up like it started to open my human potential i would say um so i became aware of things that i had never been aware of before all right was that when you open up to channeling for instance yeah like it happened kind of step by step but like i i started having out of body experiences and meeting beings and uh, like angels um and then realizing that i could communicate with them telepathically throughout my day um realizing that they were just always there like it's like the it's like we'd found each other's phone numbers and we could just call each other anytime you know um anytime i was feeling low some benevolent being would come in and explain to me what was happening and why and just be with me and hold me through that experience it was wow. very beautiful um and eventually some connections formed with specific deities and beings um where they would explain their unique relationship with me and that they have a mission you know there there's things that they they want to share with humanity um and that i'm designed in such a way that they can share that message through me um so that that's where the channeling began so uh, could you share a little bit about who you are channeling you're saying different deities and then dragons could you share who are they what are they <laughs> sure so there's three goddesses that I channel uh they are the morrigan um and hathor and hela um so it's difficult to go into like a, a huge amount of detail about them but they're essentially like ancient beings um that are as old as the earth and that are a part of the earth that like part of the life flows of the earth as uh, so the morrigan for example describes herself as like a river of consciousness that flows from the root chakra of gaia so if you imagine that our earth is actually alive 
and that she has chakras and energy systems and flows and that the deities are like rivers that flow from these chakras to specific lands on the surface and they're there to provide like life-giving energies um like to share knowledge which enables the expansion of the earth's consciousness um and all of us whether we're human or whether we these earth goddesses are the earth we're all parts of the earth just like our body has cells and limbs you could say that the goddesses are like uh like each one is like a finger of gaia and human beings are like cells within these fingers you know or you could use the analogy of uh the tree of life like if the whole tree of life is gaia then human beings are like leaves that come and go every season whereas the deities are more like branches that are there the whole time so my relationship with these deities it's like it's like i am a leaf that has realized that it's attached to a branch and is now communicating with that branch like we have a relationship and they can teach me how what the tree needs from me as a leaf if that makes sense profound oh my goodness and then we have the dragons is that something completely different it's it's linked but i my experience of the dragons is that they're more cosmic mm. um so they're linked more to the cosmos itself rather than to just the earth so i i you know i've got a scientific background so when i started having experiences of dragons <laughs> early on throughout this kundalini awakening i was like oh man like i've lost it i've <laughs> too much <laughs> like i can just about get on board with angels and deities but dragons like that's just fantasy movies um it was only really about a year ago that i really started to realize that they were they actually existed um and there's a whole story there about like how i actually connected with them but one way of understanding this is like if you look around the cultures of the earth there are images of dragons everywhere and there are images of dragons um being worshipped like deities um in in um cultures all over the world that have no connection to each other um so that it implies that there is actually some kind of a reality um there and that there may be beings that are actually can take on that dragon form uh, that have been interacting with human beings for a long time potentially from throughout the whole of human history um so when i started to connect with them i was like okay wow like these are like they feel like the goddesses and the deities that i'd been connecting with the energy was a similar strength but just uh different just like a different flavor but the way that they've connected with me um is that there's a group of them so it isn't just one being it's a group that all work together and they call themselves the dragons of the rising rose uh sometimes um there's so much like light and purity in the energy that i'm speaking about that i can get quite emotional um and i think what it is with this you know i went through my childhood feeling so alone and i think so many of us do and we feel so disconnected from other human beings and from the earth and from the cosmos and from life so sometimes i'm really moved because i'm aware of how deeply loved we are as beings and how connected we are to the cosmos and each other and earth and life that's one of the things i feel very strongly when i connect with the dragons um they will say over and over again 
the we are the cosmos the dragons are and the humans are we are all part of this one living cosmos so we are we're a team and we're a family and we're loved and we have our place within all of this so the dragons that i work with they're called the dragons of the rising rose each one of them connects to one of the major chakras of the human body so that's the seven colored chakras and then there's a, a black chakra below and a white chakra above and then there's a final dragon which um, unifies them all so there are 10 in total and since i've been connecting with them they've been sharing this message of the great return which is difficult to talk about oh well thank you so much for being so authentic and honest i i love that i cry so much myself i'm a crier and uh, i just noticed that this this really uh is coming from the heart which is really beautiful it's amazing yeah. and there's so many people out there who needs these messages so i'm just so uh grateful that you're here sharing what you're sharing today thank you <laughs> yeah it's important <laughs> You know, I, and I can feel them like they, they are very keen to share their message, you know, mm -hmm. and they care very deeply about humanity and they see us suffering mm -hmm. and they know that their message can help. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, they want this to be shared, you know, through, through our conversation, through your platform and to your listeners, um, because we are in the time of the great return. Mm. And it, it will feel like it's something terrible until we realize the deeper truth of it. You know, you can look around all, the, all over the world, you know, there are terrible things happening and we're more aware of those terrible things than we, we ever have been mm. yet. That what the dragons would say is like, what's happening is you are in the end of your winter. The, the cosmos is a single being and it has seasons that it moves through. And at the moment, Earth is in a winter. But that it, winter will end. There will be a spring. Mm. And that's I, coming. Are you channeling now or, or do you want us to go into channeling? <laughs> Let's go into channeling because that'll be that'll be easier for my emotions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so take your time. Yeah. So what I do when I channel is I, I close my eyes and I start speaking this language that I've come to know as dragon light language. Mm -hmm. The one that I will bring through today is called Flian Deshan. The names are quite difficult to pronounce, so don't no pressure to remember them. But she is the white dragon of the rising rose. So she's like the whole upper chakra, um, which is the part like the heavens, you could say. Um, I'll let her describe herself to you. It'll take me about a minute to do the, um, the focusing in and then she'll say her name a few times. And then she'll start speaking. And then I'll be back here. So I've got some awareness of what's happening. But she will be at the foreground and she'll she'll say everything all right and one last thing i'll say before i disappear is that um you may be able to feel her energy coming in um for those of you who are spiritually sensitive it's something to bear in mind um because it's useful it can help kind of train your own skill um in picking up the energies of these beings uh, it's just a useful, useful tool to have. So I'm just tuning myself in. So sometimes I'll be using the words of what I'll call our language. So I'm Fliandeshan. White Dragon of the Rising Rose, here to share with you the message of the Great Return. And whenever I come through, 
objects form. What I share most strongly is the message of my energy. The message of my energy. I am a dragon of peace. And those sensitive among you will be able to feel the peace that I extend to you. And I do this freely because I know with no doubt or hesitation that the peace that I share with you that I am calling mine is in reality yours. I am simply serving as a mirror to the peace of your own divinity. You and I are one. We are one being. It is just that my eyes are turned toward my being, our being. And because I know my being, our being, I am our being. And so it, the essence, the quality of the being that we are, our divinity, radiates through my form because I am turned toward divinity. And all I am doing here is reminding you through the direct transmission of the peace that you are, I am reminding you that you too can turn toward your divinity. This is my wish for you because you are a child of the cosmos that we are. You are a child of divinity. You deserve to live as a reflection of your divinity. And this great return that you are in, the great return of humanity, the great remembrance of humanity as the cosmos and the return of humanity to the cosmos makes your remembrance of your divinity inevitable. I would very much welcome uh, a dialogue between us uh, to speak if you feel comfortable to do so. Right, yes. I'd love to ask some questions. Uh, I am curious about the great return that you're referring to. So how long has this been going on? Did it start in 2012 or did it start way back when? And could you share a little bit more about what it actually entails? Absolutely. So the great return, it is humanity stepping from winter to spring. So once humanity was one with the cosmos, the beings here knew that they are the cosmos. And not just as an idea in their minds, they lived it as a reality, as an awakened reality inside of themselves. You could say that their being was fully illuminated with the light of divinity as they were in the summertime. However, and of course we were there at that time, we were there with the humans and we were even able to take physical form with the humans back in this time. Your histories are not quite uh, complete and there is much more to be discovered about how things actually were for your ancestors in the past. However, it was inevitable that 
you could say there would be a fall from grace. But this fall from grace was not some because some terrible thing was done so much as that it was the inevitable turning of the seasons of the cosmos. So the cosmos has seasons, there is a summer, there is a winter. And as the light from the center of the cosmos dims in this part, in this solar system, there is a retraction of spiritual knowledge. And the beings that live there go from a state of openness, unity, and a wealth of knowledge to going into a closed state like hibern hibernation or going into a seed form. Now, their self, their knowledge that was them once connected has now turned in on itself. It has lost its ability to be aware of all of this life around it that it actually is. And in this seed state, it feels disconnected and afraid because it does not know what exists outside of these walls, these walls that are its own egoic identification. Mm. Over time, the light of the cosmos returns and these seeds start to feel that light and some of them germinate. They open, they remember the cosmos around them, they live that as their own actual experience, and they try to share that message with those around them. So if you look to the early mystics going back some thousands of years, you could say that that's what those beings were. They were early seeds to open. You could call that the beginning of the great return, though the great return is something that really amplifies significantly over time, just like the dawning of the sun each day. So it is more that the great return could be said to have begun in earnest in 2012, though the foundations for it were laid far before this by many brave souls who have incarnated in your realm. Um, looking forward and how this will look like, can you share a little bit about what concrete things might happen? Uh, we have a war going on in Ukraine and the Middle East. Is that Will that grow uh, sort of because it's a symptom that we need to look at our shadow collectively before we can raise our vibration? Like, are we expecting more of wars and things like that before it gets better? Or can we expect that that is sort of the last struggle and now we're moving in onto a, into a new era that's going to feel better for humans? And... I know that you're looking at this from a different perspective, like a higher perspective, but as a human, it seems just like a lot of struggle. Yes, I know. I know. And I'm compassionate for your situation because it is a very difficult time. My advice is to go within your heart when you see these wars raging. Most of you are in resistance to this. You are saying to yourselves, consciously or unconsciously, this should not be. Now, what I'm suggesting is that you may well work against these situations. You may be called to do so, and that's all well and good. But what I encourage you to do is to do this from a ground of peace, a ground of acceptance. 
and I'm aware that this can be a big ask, but I assure you it will make your life far easier and make you far more effective in any work that you do to oppose such wars and conflicts. It is to open your heart and your being so fully that you fully accept this conflict as it is. As it is, your heart is open to it. You do not resist it. Its arising is necessary for the future flourishing of humanity. And this conflict has a right to exist. If you are able to open yourself in such a loving and accepting way, in a way that is so surrendered to the truth of what is happening, your body will become a temple in which the divine enters this world like a river. And that flowing river will flow out of you as a temple of peace and divinity, and it will touch the collective consciousness and it will soothe the, these emotional outbursts that are causing wars. It is in your deep acceptance and love of them precisely as they are, that they will be soothed and transformed. Um, have we chosen to be here at this specific time, all of the souls that are on earth right now? Did we choose this for, you know, this specific reason to be part of this great return? Yes. And uh, uh, it's difficult for me to share this through Jack's body because he will get emotional, but we love you all. We have enormous respect for you all. Sometimes people will look to beings like us as if we are somehow superior. Our experience is not like that. In fact, we experience it the other way around. We see you as superior to us because you have chosen to come here and take on a massive burden on, for yourself. You have come from pure divinity, a place of total perfection and satisfaction. You have forfeited your place there to come here to a realm that is suffering. And you've done it out of the depths of love that you are. It is a huge sacrifice. And we see all of you like that no matter who you are. We see that in all the people that you may be tempted to label as bad in the coming years. Vladimir Putin has been uh, regarded as such by many of you. We do not share this view. We hold him in high esteem in our hearts because we know that his actions are born out of the suffering of his disconnection from divinity. And we have nothing but admiration for any being that would lose themselves because we know without doubt or hesitation that each and every one of you has done this out of love for the cosmic being that we are. We are that same being. So we profit from your sacrifice. It is we who are indebted to you. It is we who admire you. All right. Um, a question came down into my mind right now. I 
look at it like this, that humans are in conflict with themselves. Like you just referred to uh, hum uh, Putin being an example, and I can feel it in myself. How can we forgive ourselves? Wonderful question. And beautifully put, because this is how you can help. This is how you help in these conflicts and these wars, because many of you are feeling helpless right now. It feels like the world is falling down around you and you can't do anything good. But that is not true. You can and you are, whether you realize it or not. How do you forgive yourself? Everything that you've done that you call bad or wrong, every harm that you've caused came from your disconnection from the truth of who you are. All of that. Anyone in your position would do the same. You have done nothing wrong by causing harm. Harm is an inevitable part of this phase of life. You needed to be disconnected and unconscious enough to cause harm because harm was necessary during this phase of human evolution and the evolution of the cosmos. You have endured it and perpetrated it for the good of us all. Now, this is quite a radical change in the way that you perceive the things that you have guilt and shame around. But in truth, you can do no wrong. Everything that you do, everything you've ever done has been held by a consciousness of life that is far superior to anything you could conceive of within your mind. It always had a plan and that plan always included the suffering that you received and gave out. There is nothing to forgive. Mm. There is nothing to forgive because nothing wrong ever happened. Wow, what a, what a perspective. Oh, what a healing perspective. Thank you so much for coming through today. I'm honored and very grateful. You're so welcome. It's a privilege to be here with you. I'm very grateful to you for allowing my message to be shared with you and through you to your audience. Thank you. Are you back? <laughs> yes, I'll, uh, Pretty much. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, that was really powerful and beautiful. I, I got touched there. It was like really intense in a way. Yeah. I, I just felt so present uh, with life and everything and with that energy. And the, the, the answer that came through was really helpful. How do you feel? Do you remember anything? Yeah, I'm kind of like in between places at the moment. Um, so what I feel is very, very peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of touched by life. Mm -hmm. um, and a little tired. <laughs> That's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jack, uh, I have three questions that I ask all my guests. And the first one is, what is self-love to you? Uh, like that's remembering who we are, like remembering that we've always been love and that 
that can never ever be taken away from us mm. and what is happiness to you it's probably the same thing <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and what is for me for me it's like that's like a I experience that as just like I'll deviate from happiness when I I get caught in my emotions and I forget mm. who and what I am. But when I remember when I turn back to the spirit that is just all around me and pervading me in all ways, then I I remember happiness and I feel it and it doesn't matter what's actually happening. Uh, I can be deeply happy while in a queue, you know, waiting in line, or even when going through a tragedy. Um, I'm not saying I'm always like this, not at all, but it can happen and it is there. Hmm. And what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? The deeper meaning of life, first to to realize that we are life and to discover the life that we are and then to live that as fully as we can in as a way that is as expanded and connected with as many beings in this living cosmos as possible. And Jack, how can people reach you? And could you share a little bit about how you can be of service to people if they need help? For sure. Yeah. So I do, um, I do healing sessions where I'm like in my humanity. And then I do others where I'm uh, channeling the goddesses or the dragons for people. And you can find out about that at my website, which is myrisingrose.com, named after the dragons of the rising rose. And I also do a group where every Saturday and every other Monday we, we gather together. On the Saturdays I do channelings. And then on the Mondays we do something called an integration session where we all meet and talk together. And I intentionally take myself off the, the kind of stage or the pedestal of being the one who's doing these channelings so that we can all meet as human beings and just mm -hmm. talk normally. So beautiful. <laughs> Well, it's been such a joy having you on the show. It really enriched me. Uh, it inspired me and it felt so healing. And I feel it did also for my audience today. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.